Hello and welcome to this, our final workshop in this The Biggest Idea in Education project that we've been doing. I'm just going to jump into it because, oh my gosh, there's a lot of stuff to cover in this. Not just cover, but uncover and oh, just, just wait. Okay, so it is an open secret in what I affectionately refer to as Egan land uh, that Kieran Egan's ideas are notoriously difficult to communicate with accuracy. The thing that I've been doing this entire time has been to take the most obvious aspects of what he has said and hold, sorry, and put them out the front and take all of the theoretical stuff and hold it for the back. In Egan's own writings, oftentimes just reading it, I get this feeling of it's like everybody trying to, it's like a little Three Stooges routines, right? It's like everybody trying to come through a doorway at the same time. He has all the recommendations and the things that are going on in theory, and he also has the, I can't even, I, 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 need, I need to not say more about this, because the theory itself has so many moving pieces that I don't want to give any, any spoilers for this workshop. What I have done is try to separate those out, which is to say that today is 100% theory. You may find that today's workshop is of no practical benefit <laughs> to you in your making of schools or making of homeschooling or what have you at all. Now, that said, I think that's probably not right because, well, Originally, the notion for what we were going to be talking about today was how can we help our kids really understand the world, which I thought was big picture. But now that I'm going through Egan and I'm putting all this together, I realize the reason that, I mean, that other forms of education, in my experience, do not get us what we want. It's because their definition of education is 100%, it's not 100% wrong, is very wrong. Their, their definitions of education are fundamentally flawed. So, taking this, raising it up to 11, the riddle of our workshop is nothing more or less than... What is education? <laughs> I'm going to give you a full 30 seconds. Go ahead and throw in either your own definitions of education or what you think, uh, how you think Egan is going to define education. Uh, maybe you want to differentiate and say which of those you are saying. I suddenly see that one of my drapes has fallen down. If I'm more echoey today, I apologize. Preparation for the world we live in. Thank you. It's very John Dewey. No, no. I'm thinking of the opposite, actually. What I wanted to do was have a whole bunch of famous quotes by educational thinkers as to how they defined education. And I held back on that because it turns out that when you ask educational thinkers to define education, they are way too prone to give these like beautiful poetic answers that are really of no use in doing anything and making schools and making a classroom, you know, like to experience God, right? That's that sort of stuff. Um, uh, John Dewey's was famously... Uh, education is the process of living itself and not mere preparation for living. Okay, thank you, John Dewey. Education is living. That should help us. That gives us some good hints as to what to do with schools. I mean, in some ways it tells you what not to do, at least from Dewey's perspective. But um, enlightening, learning lessons, ideally by accident, using the thoughts and actions of those before you to form your own way of thinking and acting, satisfying the curiosities of life and connecting with others. These are fantastic. And some of these, I don't know if uh, these are our own or are, are what we think Egan is going to say. Um, but I will say that some of these do overlap with, uh, with what Egan puts together. A few more seconds. Think about, as we do this, what, like, what Montessori would say, what uh, what Rudolf Steiner, the progenitor of Waldorf education, would say, what a classical schooling person would say, what an unschooling person would say, what a vocational schooling person might say. All right. By the end of this, we're going to have a sense of what I think how Egan would define education. All right. Here it goes. All Oh. 
I don't have a bunch of clues for you. I can just tell you that at the end of this entire thing, this is going to be a really important picture. <laughs> we sacrificed many cameras getting this photograph. Okay. In the second workshop, we talked about the cognitive strengths that kids who are elementary age bring to the table. And then in the workshop after that, oh, so many things. We talked about the obsessions that adolescents bring that we can use for schooling. And then in the most recent one, we talked about the things that motivates a mad scientist. My question right now is all three of these things. What are these? <laughs> I've been calling these developmental stages, but these small things, right? This asking big questions and the finding their place in the cosmos and the gossip and the heroes and the collections and the mental images and the emotional binaries. What the heck are all of these things? Egan's idea is that all of these things can be thought of as tools. Does that make sense? Hold on to that idea for a minute. I want you to imagine that you, um, so if those individual things are tools, great. Now, what are the big things of this? What are these developmental stages really? Because it turns out that I've been terribly lying to you and these are not really developmental stages. They are kind of like developmental stages and you can mistake them for them, but, um, but they're very different and they're very different in unbelievably, a few unbelievably crucial ways. Try to figure out what these t what teenage obsessions have in common with elementary uh, cognitive strengths have in common with what motiv the motivations of a mad scientist. I want you to imagine this. The government comes to you and it says, we really, really want to understand this cove and what is going on in this cove. And we have our reasons and you may figure them out, but we want you to understand this cove as well as possible. And you're thinking, okay, all right, I got to do it. I can spend a bunch of time with this, you know, 24-7 for like a couple of years. The government's like, ah, you have a month. Or you're like, okay, okay, 24-7 for like a month. But then I need, if I don't have time, I need to try to figure out, you know, like different, different ways of understanding it. So what you do is you run over to your alma mater, mater, alma mater, I don't know how to pronounce that, which just happens to be a very beautiful university. And you go to all of your old professors there who represent all of these different disciplines. And you ask all of them to come help you understand this cove. My question for you right now, and I'll give you 10 seconds, is how many ways could you understand the cove if you brought all of the professors from Cambridge University to come study the cove Go for it. Ten. Nine. Go ahead and guess. This list is not exhaustive. About a hundred. Countless. Three, two, one. Oh, it's really good. As many different ways as there are different professors. What Egan would argue is that if you brought all of the main and might, is that a phrase, to bear from, of, uh, of Cambridge University to bear on understanding this one cove, you could have exactly one kind of understanding about this cove. There is more than one kind of understanding in the world. But if, if this, if, if all of these, <laughs> If all of our academic apparatus is just one single kind of understanding, then, then what other kinds of understanding could there possibly be? Go ahead and take 20 seconds. See if you could, is anything floating to mind? Just imagine though, like as people type this in, what would it be like if you had a geologist come and like look at the rocks of that and a geographer come and like look at how this cove sits on a map and like actually like map even like the small spaces of this looking at things that are not just like, um, you know, like, I don't know, the human geography of it, but like the natural geography or the animal geography. Um, you could do, I don't know, the veterinary, I don't know, there in the corner would be particularly helpful, but definitely the zoology, right, would be very important for this. You could talk about the military applications of this, which might be important for the government that you are advising. You could talk about the actual human history of the thing and the prehistory of the thing. You talk about the chemistry. There's so many chemicals that are going on there, right? You could try to understand it through the arts. You could try to understand it by looking at the physics of what is going on, like the power of the waves, right? There's so many kinds of understanding here, but 
the way that Egan is looking at this is that this, all of these just amount to one. Can I say right now, the experience that I kept having in graduate school when I was studying educational leadership at the University of Washington was just everything that I was learning was such weak sauce compared to what I was reading obsessively about an Egan. Like one of like the cool big ideas in curriculum theory is like, oh, we should have like multidisciplinary learning. So in a single lesson, you might learn some geology and some geography and some philology or something like that. And Egan's like, no, no, oh gosh, no, people, people, right? This is small potatoes. <laughs> Zoom out! It's missing sensorial, observation, intuition, innate knowledge, emotional, sensory, all right, I love these guesses. Uh, I want to give you a, I want to give you another hint for this. I want you to imagine that you brought into this cove one of your friends who is a kung san. They will someday be able to differentiate between their clicks. There are multiple clicks. And Kung Sang, that mean different things. Do you know that the original human language may have involved clicks? It's kind of, kind of, kind of fun. And you have them start to understand what is going on in that cove. And then you have some of your friends who are Sami, the natives of, uh, of Finland, to understand this. And you have a friend who is Lakota come and try to understand exactly what is going on in this cove. And then you have some of your friends who are Ainu, a native population of Japan, come and try to understand what is going on in this cove. How many ways of understanding would these four groups of people represent? 10 seconds, go ahead and take your guess. I like the four plus. Okay, so what Egan would definitely say if you asked him this question is at least four different ways <laughs> of understanding. Because there's, are you familiar with this idea of indigenous knowledge systems? This is becomes a political flashpoint sometimes. Uh, so there is a traditional Ainu way of understanding the world. And there's a traditional Lakota and a traditional Sami and a traditional Kunsang way of understanding things. And these ways Egan would emphasize are quite different from each other. But have you heard of have you heard of the book? My my worldview was rocked when I heard of the book Human Universals by Donald E. Brown, I think it was 1991, came out. And you don't need to read the book. It's hard to get your hands on the book. It's kind of a rare book. But the appendix of the book is everything. What Donald Brown, anthropologist, did was bring together all of the anthropological literature he could get his hands on on all of the different societies that we have any record of. And what he was interested in was not the wild diversity, not what makes us different from all of these, all these different societies, but whether there were in fact any commonalities that we could observe existing in every single society that we have any evidence of. And what he did was make a list would you like to see the list? <laughs> They're in alphabetical order. Why didn't I learn about this list <laughs> when I was in high school? Why didn't I learn about it when I was in college? Uh, you know, you should always be careful of one scholar's take on anything. Now, this is not his own independent scholarship. I mean, it sort of is, right? He's, re he's re relying on different peer-reviewed, published 
anthropological stuff, um, reports. Uh, uh, but, you know, probably he got some of this wrong, because how could anyone not get some of this wrong? So please do not misinterpret this as absolutely proven, right? The purpose of this was to, well, collect a lot of things and then start a conversation about, like, whoa, what, is, what the heck is going on here? And I wonder if you can guess why I have highlighted some of these things. Levers. L the lever. See, I didn't even know. I've never noticed that one before. It's been such a long time. Mood-altering techniques and or substances. Onomatopoeia. You know, like, blam! It's loud! Some of these are very obvious, right? Pain was on the last page of it. Yes, right? No one really wondered if that was the case. Synonyms is interesting. The notion of visiting is interesting. All of these are interesting, obviously. Turn-taking. And then he added some on. Oh, 89, not 91. What these things seem to be, are the tools that humanity made in order to spread throughout the world, in order just to survive in a world that thought that they were delicious. Egan would be very, very emphatic. <laughs> Lakota and uh, Mori and different way, Asami, different ways, different indigenous uh, systems are not, indigenous knowledge systems are in, by no means identical. But they share some interesting commonalities. They are more different from each other than, you know, American culture is from French culture. But they're not wholly dissimilar. As humanity headed out into the world, this is what we had to make it. Now, do any of these, having seen that list, look familiar to you? All of these, with I think one exception, were found in that list of human universals. Indigenous knowledge systems are ways of evolving, developing, building on, making more specific, making ever more powerful to live in a specific environment. This seemingly universal human set of tools, call it a toolkit. Have you heard, it's not just Egan who's saying this, have you heard of um, Robin, Dr. Robin uh, Kimmer before? A few, years, a few years ago, I studied indigenous knowledge um, uh, when I was in undergraduate, uh, Ojibwe cosmology specifically, and the ways that Ojibwe cosmology made a huge difference in how uh, the Ojibwe were able to live in the world, in ways that are actually very different from our modern Western ways of living in the world. Uh, this became a better known popular level topic with the book Braiding Sweetgrass that came out a few years ago. She gave an interview, it's on uh, YouTube and I will probably link it in the email that I send out, but she said, there's no replacement from learning from the land herself. Note, note the pronoun. 
you learn to exercise all of your facilities, not just your intellect, your mental powers to know how the world is, but how to feel how the world is, to sense it, to develop a relationship with it. We know that we learn so much better when we're engaging our memories, when we're engaging stories, when we're engaging our aesthetic senses. And I'm sorry, but that doesn't happen much in a textbook. So to me, the place to learn to become a biologist, she's a professor of biology, to learn to become a naturalist is on the land. In the wild diversity of different sorts of, indig of different indigenous knowledge systems, and in the wild diversity of disciplines that we have in the modern university, we can see, as very dissimilar from each other, two different kinds of understanding. I think it's time, I think it's time to, to put this in. This is going to be our attempt to be the one picture that explains everything. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Okay, so we have talked thus far about these different tools that we can use at these in these different elementary, middle, and high school. We have talked about, oh, it is time, I suppose, now to tell you what Egan has named these different things. The first that we just talked about as the developmental stage of elementary school is mythic. Or let me say he called mythic. I'm never totally happy with these names. And it's important to understand, to not these, take these names too seriously. There are reasons that he called them these, and we could talk about them. The second, middle school, he called romantic. In the third, high school, he called philosophic. So let's add this to this. These are all kinds of understanding. You can think about them as humanity's original tool kits for surviving and thriving in the world. We haven't talked much about the romantic for this. I've given an example of indigenous knowledge and how mythic is sort of the base state of indigenous knowledge. Mythic should not be confused with, for example, Ojibwe uh, 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 indigenous knowledge. Uh, Egan is not saying, emphatically not saying, we should teach kids um, Potawatomi uh, uh, indigenous knowledge uh, in, in elementary school. Uh, uh, Kimimur is Potawatomi. Uh, he is rather saying that all of these kinds of indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems grow out of, are developed out of, this base state of mythic understanding. We talked about the, the sort of the cultural analogs of that and the cultural analogs of philosophic in the modern university. We haven't talked about romantic, and that is that's because for Egan, the romantic toolkit, romantic understanding is sort of this mermaid. It's half in the water, it's half out of the water. It is this Talk more about that, actually, in a little bit. Okay, whew. let me give us our Mad Libs for this. It is, we are able now to start guessing some of these. Go ahead, feel free to chat in any guesses that you have. I will say that this and this and this are the ones that I think most easily can be guessed right now. Take another 10 seconds. All right. Yeah, this is hard, isn't it? Uh, 
I think a really interesting question that we don't ask often enough is why humans? What's so special about humans? Why were humans the ones who developed all of this, I don't know, civilization, society? In the class that I do called Crows Are Weird, we talk about the very real ways in which you can say that crows do have societies, crows do have cultures. But even granted all of that, right? They're, they're, they have accents that they can recognize in other crows. They have seemingly some different ways of doing things and maybe some different ethics, if we want to call it ethics. I want to call it ethics, but right, we can, we can talk about maybe some, some, some slight differences in how crows are. But human societies are so diverse and we can just do so much with them. What the heck? What made humans special? I think a really common answer to that. Oops, not you, you. This is a picture of Lucy, the Australopithecus Africanus. I can't pronounce the species name. Lucy lived about, oh, gosh, I think five million years ago, three or four, five million years ago, I think three. Uh, we parted from chimpanzees about six, not 10 million years ago. She's like, yeah, somewhere in there. She is on, she's probably your direct grandmother, great, 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 whatever. She seems to be on this evolutionary path that is special. What allowed humans to spread and develop societies? Oftentimes, you know, the famous answers to this, this is a question that used to be kept around a lot, right? The fact that we have opposable thumbs. Yeah, I think that's actually an important piece of it. Um, the idea that humans walk upright. I guess usually it's the upright thing that allows us to grab things and then work with objects. Yeah, I think that's actually important too. Sure, great. Oftentimes the answer is given that, oh, like humans are just so much smarter than other animals are. And, and that's true, right? Almost regardless of how you want to define intelligence, humans have more of it, if you want to reify it, than anything else. However, one weird wrinkle in this is that this is a Homo sapiens sapiens skull, and this is a Homo neanderthalus skull. This is a Neanderthal, Neanderthal. Uh, we interbred with them. They were Homo sapiens, right? Homo sapiens, Neanderthalus, I think. Did I just say that wrong a second ago? They go back and forth as to whether they want to call them different species or not. But like, they're humans too. Anything in the genus Homo is a human too. The weird thing though, <laughs> is that we won, but they had bigger brains. This is pointed out in the really excellent book by Joe Henrik, The Secret of Our Success, where he points out, he asks this question, like what is it that made humans win in the whole interspecies game. And he points out that you can, you know, among apes, do a really good job of guessing how intelligent an ape will be based on the size of its brain, at least the size of its brain, um, uh, compared to the rest of its body size, right? Like a gorilla, I don't know if a gorilla has a bigger brain than you do, but you almost expect it to, right? Because it's so much bigger than we are, but they're not more intelligent. We have the biggest brains, or almost the biggest brains, uh, uh, for any animal uh, based on our body size. I think belugas might actually have a higher <laughs> one, but it seems like they're doing something weird and different with theirs. So it doesn't actually seem to be intelligence that, that allowed us to conquer the world. <laughs> if it wasn't intelligence, and if it wasn't the fact that we have uh, opposable thumbs, 20 seconds, any guesses? for what it might be. Here's an interesting way of asking this question. Imagine a child who is deaf and mute and has not yet learned to sign. What can she do that a chimpanzee cannot do. If you think that sounds like it was orchestrated to be maximally offensive to that child, I, I put it that way. Because so often we think that the thing that makes us special is our language. 
Steve Pinker, in his book How the Mind Works, said, language is to humans as web spinning is to spiders. It is the thing that we do <laughs> that is better than any, uh, that, that, that no other animal can do. Can, can do. Uh, and it takes us so far. It rearranges everything about our lives. Yes, he's not wrong. I fully agree with that. But remember that there was a really long time before humans were able to speak. And yet we were still in the beginning of taking over Africa when we, before we could speak. The guess for how long uh, the genus Homo has been around is something like, I'm going to get this wrong. Oh gosh, it's like something like 3 million years or something like that. Homo sapiens, I'm probably getting that terribly wrong. Uh, Homo sapiens, uh, we kick around guesses about 200,000 years or 300,000 years, something like that. But we've probably only been able to speak for like 100,000 years. We're saying that the majority of the time that there have been humans, humans did not have language. No, no anthrop I, I don't think that any anthropologist disagrees with that idea. Humans are not fundamentally linguistic. We were doing quite well, thank you very much, before we came up with language. What the ever-loving heck, right? It's not our massive claws or our horns or, you know, like our rugged good looks that kept us alive. What the heck is it? How did humans survive on the plains of the Serengeti or wherever without even having language? How did we knit each other, knit ourselves together into groups without even having language? Adaptive communication, think about thinking, plan for the future. I think that all these things have some peace in it, but how did we communicate if we didn't have the ability to speak? <laughs> what the heck is going on? What can a deaf mute pre-language, pre-sign language, girl do far, far, far better than a chimpanzee. Perhaps you've seen some of like the cognitive tests that compare chimpanzees and children or chimpanzees and you, and it turns out there are actual interesting cognitive things that chimpanzees can do far, far, far better than human beings can. Like their working memory, well, we have like about three or four item, uh, spots in our working memory, things that we can kind of hold up. Uh, if I throw you like three numbers, right, you can probably keep three of them in your head right away. Um, uh, but like 10, nope, like you're going to drop them, you're going to fail at that, right? Like they can hold 20 without pausing. In some ways, chimps are smarter than us, but there is something that we do, <laughs> uh, even before language, that they cannot do. An interesting thing of this is that a Deaf, mute, pre-sign language girl can play games, can learn games and play games. Have you noticed that it's interesting that in the that in this there is a space that is before mythic here? I'll even put the numbers in here, right? There's a space before mythic. Uh, I have a seven week old. What can she do that a chimpanzee probably cannot do? How is it that we learn to speak in the first place? Empathize, care for others, drag someone around and make them pay attention to what you want them to pay attention to. Yeah, and where does that come from? <laughs> So before all of these things, there is another toolkit. This toolkit is what Egan calls the somatic, sorry, the somatic toolkit. Somatic is from a Greek word that means uh, bodily. And the tools that are inside it include your physical five senses, the fact that you have emotion, humor, it's actually a really big one, didn't have to space to squeeze it in there, um, rhythm. Uh, our love of playing. But there's one even bigger thing going on with this, and that is that we love to imitate. My daughter is seven weeks old, and we've just in the last week gotten to that thing where I will stick out my tongue, she'll look at me, and then she'll look to the side, and then she'll stick out her tongue. 
or vice versa, and then she'll smile again, right? If, if she does it first, then I do it. She'll give it but the laugh at that. It's fantastic. Humans are the imitating animal. Obviously, yes, parrots, but parrots don't do it the same way that we do it. A parrot can imitate, and imitate quite well, thank you. Crows, right, jackdaws, magpies, I'm thinking of magpies make the cool nests. Some other birds that can do that even better. But they don't do it meaningfully. We can take something that we see somebody do, we can store it in our memories, and then we can bring it out at our choice and enact that again. We can take uh, for a meeting in a, in a new context to communicate something that we saw happen before. We can take these things, we can put them, these, these imitations, we've, things we've seen other people do, and we can put them in a new order and tell a story with this. You will have young kids, pre-linguistic, pre-talking kids, who are able to act out things that happened to them. Even though they don't have words, <laughs> even though they've never had these sorts of things happen to them before by just taking other things they've seen and put them together. We can use these things to share attention with one another. I'll, you'll see me pointing at something, when if you're a baby, right? And then you'll learn, oh, he's pointing, he's pointing over there. And we can share intentionality by imitating one another. We are the copying species. Egan's notion is that that, two things. One, this kicks everything else off. We have these tools around, powered by imitation before we can do anything else. And secondarily, what is it that all of these things are? These things themselves are us imitating what other people have done before. We don't have to invent the idea of heroes, and it's probably not genetically in ourselves. But we hear it, we like it, it hits some sort of evolutionary right buttons or whatever. But we hear it, we like it, and we can start using it. We don't have to create for ourselves the notion of big theories. We see other people do that, and it catches. It catches like fire. It catches like a disease in us. We imitate our way through all of these toolkits. Okay. Let me ask this question. Pretend you didn't see that. What is special <laughs> about these ages? It's interesting how, uh, if I'm right, I think that in different writings, Egan gives slightly different age ranges for all of these things. I might be wrong about that. Uh, and I'm not quite using his either. I think he says like 2 to 7 and then 8 to 15 or 8 to 14 and then 15 to, yeah, that's like twice as many numbers as I'm able to remember, right? My working memory is very low, so I've simplified these things here. And anyway, right, like one should never be too punctilious about specific numbers when it has to do with like developmental stages or whatever for kids. That said, isn't it interesting that when you're talking about ages, kids' ages, some of these ages keep cropping up, right? Just to take a silly example, I can see it. I can't pronounce that. I'm not going to try to pronounce that word. Uh, in Mexican culture, a girls and increasingly boys, when they turn 15 years old, right? Big party. That's interesting. In I'm getting my Catholic theology right. Age of seven or something is said to be the age of reason when you are responsible for your faith yourself. It's around the ages, right? Eakin gave 8 to 14. It's around age 14 that a bar and bat mitzvahs happen. Um, we sort of, uh, in the Waldorf education, we talk about the the canines falling out, the period where the eye teeth fall out, which is, if I'm right about that, about seven or eight or something like that. And like that is supposed to like denote like, oh, we can move into this different stage of education, right? It's as if these, these, these ages actually do seem to be describing some sort of important reality, some sort of cognitive change that is happening in kids. And we have these different ways of trying to explain what the heck is going on. Egan has them too. What the heck is going on? <laughs> I'll give 
I, w I want to give just the weirdest dang story. Okay, so this is a picture of Alexander Luria. Alexander Luria was the student of Lev Vygotsky, the great Soviet psychologist, and Luria himself would go on to become the great Soviet psychologist of his age in the 19... I think it was the early 1930s, it may be in the late 1920s. Luria, under Vygotsky's supervision, um, went out into the hinterlands, uh, the boonies of the Soviet Union, uh, the Caucasus Mountains, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, um, and, uh, and, and went to meet with and present a few simple questions to the people who lived there. And he found, I, I think the specific example is with some Uzbeks. And he asked them a very simple question. In the far north, where there is snow, all bears are white. Novaya Zemlya, nope, wrong, failed, is in the far north. What color are the bears there? Pay very close attention to this. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Good luck. Five, four, there are no bears. Three, two, galaxy brain. One and... I just want to say that only one person gave the right answer, which is white, because you're used to me giving trick questions to you. This is not intended to be a trick question. I'm sorry. I totally set that up as if that would have been, and it's not supposed to be. It's totally not supposed to be. That's on me. I'm so sorry. The answer is white. Now, I've got to ask you, in your heart, do you feel like you knew the answer to that question? Here's the interesting thing. The answer that the Uzbeks in the 1920s gave to Luria included answers like, I've never been in the North and have never seen bears. And if you want an answer to that question, you should ask people who have been there and who have seen them. <laughs> and there are different kinds of bears. If one is born red, he'll stay that way. And my favorite, your words can be answered only by someone who was there. And if a person wasn't there, he can't say anything on the basis of your words. All right. This question is so easy for us. <laughs> it was virtually impossible for many adults in uh, Uzbekistan a hundred years ago. What the ever-loving heck? What is the difference between you and them? 20 seconds, go for it. Is there snow? I mean, I don't know, maybe? Yes? Polar bear doesn't change its color just because there isn't any snow. Although a lot of the other animals in that area do, right? Building on previous knowledge. Okay, making assumptions. They did not have you messing with their minds. <laughs> We're used to word problems. That's definitely true. Maybe you're thinking that this is easy because we know what polar bears are, right? Okay, so like, if you change it to a nonsense word, all crumbles are mauve. I pick mauve because in my experience, nobody knows what the color mauve actually is. This is already sort of a nonsense word to English speakers. In the far north, that's really good. What color are the crumples there? Uh, I think you'd be able to get this. I think it's not just about the bears. Okay, so a hint for this comes in the answer that one person gave to him. That person said, from your words, 
it means that bears there are white. Isn't that an interesting phrase from your words? And that person just so happened to be the town priest who had learned to read, albeit as an adult. But wait, you say, I thought that this, was exa this exam was given out loud. It was. From this, Luria concluded, and there's been so much evidence, so much evidence <laughs> uh, since then to back this up, that there is something magical about learning to read and write. Learning to read and write seems to offer us a new type of thinking. Perhaps it's something about just the words being glued down on the page. All of a sudden, you can think about words. You are, you know, detached from the world. Maybe it's a good thing, you're liberated. Maybe it's a bad thing, you're alienated. But you're detached from your senses and the world around you. And you are able to think just about the words that you hear. Egan gives tons of examples of this, and each one is cooler than the last. The ability to think what we call logically. I don't mean well, I don't mean rationally. I mean logically, according to logic. Seems to come only to people, almost only to people, who have learned to read and write, and from a fairly early age, too, is a hypothesis at this People who learn to read and write at a later stage, um, uh, their brains look different um, than people who learn to read and write at a younger stage. There's a part of your left hemisphere right about here by your ear, I think, called the FFA, the fusiform facial area, something like that, um, that uh, ordinarily is used to pay attention to faces, to recognize human faces, right? We have a specific little part of our brain that just focuses on like, you know, because everyone basically looks the same, right? Like telling like this person immediately apart from somebody else. And we use that part of our brain when we learn to read and write at an early age. We commandeer it and we then, uh, um, 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 and then we, uh, we, we get good at recognizing letters. Um, if you learn to do it later in life, uh, it's too late. You can't do it. Uh, interestingly, there are costs with this. Uh, you can recognize faces worse, it seems, um, if you learn to read and write at an early age. Nothing comes without its costs. Okay, why are we saying all this? The thing that seems to drive these different developments these different ways of coming at the world, these different kinds of understanding, Egan says, seem to be the ways that we use language. Before we have language, we imitate. Then when we learn to talk, we can come at the world in a certain way. And it turns out that even if you don't know how to read or write, you can use these mental images, these stories, these fairly simple stories, right? If you look at oral cultures, cultures that don't yet, uh, well, have not learned to read and write, um, their stories are very simple stories. Think of uh, Grimm's fairy tales, right? That was a uh, pre-literate oral culture. Um, think, um, I don't know, think like the stories that are sort of daisy chained together in the Hebrew Bible. Think, uh, think of a lot of things, Mother Goose sort of stuff. Um, well, no, not Mother Goose. Comes, that's a weirder story. Um, uh, we're able to do metaphors, and we can become really, really good at these. But some of these obsessions with what other people are... Is that part right? I might need to be careful about that one. The sense of heroizing even small details, of having these abstract ideals and this lust for extremes, these conceptual extremes... It seems to be that you need reading and writing to trigger those. You're asking, okay, then what about the philosophic toolkit? Egan is... Egan never hammered this one as clearly as I would have liked him to, and I think I know why that was, and I might talk about that after class if anyone is... Uh, after the workshop, 
anyone is interested. Um, the short answer to it is that there was a time in history where we had writing, but the writing was just kind of lame. It was just a bunch of lists and things of that nature. And then we got better at it, and we came up with these like narratives. And there was this really cool moment in human history. You see it in a couple of different cultures. Uh, you see it um, especially uh, in ancient Greece, um, right after writing was, uh, was invented. Um, there's this period where people are writing down these stories and these travelogues. He quotes Herodotus, author of the Histories, which is kind of the Guinness Book of World Records of its day, where it's talking about, and then there's this culture, and they're really weird in this way, and there's this culture, and they have this hero, and this hero was so cool because, wow! It has this sort of depth of specificity, of complexity, that you couldn't actually hold in an oral storytelling culture. You can get the Iliad and the Odyssey in an oral storytelling culture if like, you have bards who memorize these like long rhyming or whatever poems that are thousands of lines long, but they're using story and they're using images and they're using all these things to kind of hold that together as one big unit. You can't that you can't do that with the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, uh, writing allowed people to get this really cool thing. And then after that, they started using writing in a different way. They started writing systematically. And Egan did not, to my knowledge, explain what that meant as well as, as I am comfortable with kind of easily defining it as right now. Um, but you know, you can imagine like a, a textbook oh, would be one kind of systematic writing. Um, uh, you know, a book like Guns, Germs, and Steel, or Sapiens, or um, or you know, any kind of like, anything like that, right? That would be the Better Angels of Our Nature, we, like we talked about last week. Any of those would be thesis-driven, right? Like now, you lose this point and this point and this point to defend it, right? That's systematic writing, and writing like that allows you to hold these careful arguments in your mind. You keep you know, flipping back to pages to see parts that you forgot or whatever. Um, that um, that is, is different and that allows you a different kind, kind of scaffolds a different kind of understanding um, uh, uh, than uh, just like ordinary, like writing down cool narratives and travel logs or whatever it gives you. <sighs> these exist, these existed, we copy these. I said at the end, I think, of the first workshop, that one clue for what Egan's theory is all about, or what it runs on, is this, uh, was, it was hinted at by a little girl pointing to a map. What that refers to is Vygotsky and Luria's, their big idea, that we learn how to think by imitating each other. And Vygotsky, Luria's teacher, uh, his one of his big examples was like, you see somebody pointing, and you're like, oh, I can, I, I think I understand what they're doing. I can point too, and we just we pick things, these symbols like this, up, and a map, right? Like you see a map, and all of a sudden you're like, oh wow, like that is the world, and you begin to think about the world differently, because somebody somewhere like came up with the map. This is where this idea of cognitive tools you'll sometimes hear about in educational circles. That this is where they uh, they come from. What Egan does, which kind of is a little bit in Luria in this idea of writing, but then Egan just goes wild with, is the most mocked idea in all of zoology, in all of evolutionary science, which is ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. It's famous almost because it's hard to pronounce. Ontogeny means the development of the individual. So you can think of that as the development of you when you were in the womb. You can think about that as the development of you from, you know, when you started in preschool to nowadays, right? Your sort of cognitive individual uh, development. Phylogeny is something like, well, phylogeny means the evolutionary development of your species or of your lineage going back even before, you know, your specific species. And there was a period in, after Darwin in the late 1800s, where one of the coolest ideas was that, okay, like, at the beginning, it's like humans, this is a, this is your embryo, right? Here's, this is what you turn into. Um, you get a lot bigger too, FYI. Um, that uh, uh, you go through a fish stage. Oh, that's interesting because Darwin said that we, you know, our ancestors were distant ancestors of fish. Then you go through this, I don't know, does it, does that look like an amphibian? Like a, uh, a salamander or something to anybody else here, right? You go through this amphibious stage. You're like, oh, that's interesting because 
Darwin said that first there were fish, and then there were amphibians, and they evolved out of each other. And then there were... Oh, excuse me. I am screwing this up because I'm forgetting the order that these things go in to, right? Like, this is a chicken <laughs> right over here, and I am screwing this up entirely. F1, A1. So they go like... Yeah, they're going down. Very good. Very good. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. So we all start like this. And then we all end up like fish or salamander. That is a salamander. Or a chicken, is that? Or a pig or a dog or a human, right? So the idea is we go through each of those phases. And I think I picked this picture fairly wrong. Okay. But the idea is that we look like each other. This was ended up being proven... My understanding of this is that it's, like, not exactly wrong, but it's not nearly as right as they thought it was. And so it got to be mocked. And so now it's the sort of thing that if you want to actually talk about Evo Devo, um, uh, um, evolutionary developmental biology, right? How is it <laughs> that how can you see the fingerprints of evolution in your developmental biology from an embryo on? You never say <laughs> that phrase. Um but what Egan is arguing for is this notion that your the development of the educated man or woman actually sort of looks like the development of human civilization's idea and possibilities in education. <laughs> that we can learn to be romantic when we learn to write and read only because other people spent a heck of a long time hammering that out in front of us, that we can learn to be philosophic, abstract, theoretical, only because other people have spent a really long time hammering that out ahead of us. We catch these things, but we catch them in roughly the order that they first occurred in the world. Okay. That's good enough. What is education? My recommendation would be to try these. Whoops, would be to try. Oh, it's the wrong color. Would be to try these ones. And these two. And I will give some specific hints as to these. What color have I not used yet? I don't think I've used red. Red looks like blood right now. I'm not going to go for it. I'm going to use purple. Yeah. Yeah. Learning to read and write is exactly right. No, wait. Hold on. Not read and write. I'll keep that as a hint. It's too easy. Less bloody. Yeah. New kinds of understanding. Not quite long enough, but what are you going to do? All right. What exactly is wrong with calling these stages? I feel like I made this big song and dance a few minutes ago. saying, how dare you? How dare you call these stages? But look, the way that we've drawn this really draws them like that. Well, you know, every picture tells a lie. And there is a lie that is baked into the way that I drew these. Because, you know, I was trying to draw it to be understandable, at least basically, <laughs> right here. Oh, I'm not even playing people chat, am I? Okay, so I'll just <laughs> let me move on with that. Um, 
it's like this. When we say the idea, when we use the word stages, we imagine something that is hard and something you can stand on and, you know, stages imply that you can like move, you can like jump from one of these things to another. But is it actually true that with those kinds of understanding, that we just jump from one of those to the other, somatic, and then at age two, right, we stop using those, we stop having emotions, we stop having senses, we move to mythic, and then after that we stop doing metaphors, and then we know, right, of course that's not true, of course that's not. The idea is that each of these things actually builds on each other, that they stack. Stacking, perhaps, is an unhelpful metaphor in the sense that, like, they're not kind of merging in. It's almost like you're pouring different kinds of lava over each of them because, like, the core original one of somatic is, like, both, like, the foundation of all of them, but also, like, it's still, like, in the core of all of them. They're, like, really touching each other. Uh, the um, One of the scholars that Egan refers to uh, for a mythic... Uh, sorry, not for mythic, for a somatic understanding, um, is a, a guy named Merlin Donald who says that this mimesis, this imitation, is actually the beating heart of our minds still. And, you know, like if somebody is an impressive fancy pants scholar, you know, when they are in their, they spend uh, their day job um, uh, thinking about these, like, you know, abstract, abstruse theories, when they're stuck in traffic on the way home, are they? Well, you know, maybe. <laughs> but maybe they're thinking about gossip. And maybe they're thinking about, you know, these, uh, these just like the stupid stories, or about like, like the simple stories that kind of, you know, like, ah, oh, the other political side, they're evil, they're terrible, ours is the good side, or whatever. No, like, like you, scratch, you scratch somebody and you find all of these going on underneath them. But it turns out that that, this, this metaphor of stacking is itself problematic. Because, well, let me turn the chat on. Can you figure out why this is still way wrong? In fact, terrifyingly and helpfully wrong. I'll give you a hint. The death of Socrates. So one of the, draw this here, here will be, oops, here will be somatic, and here will be mythic, and then philosophic, nope, sorry, romantic's next. And then philosophic. We need to be careful that we don't lie and tell a harmonious history where none exists. Socrates was executed because what he was doing was bringing this philosophic mindset, this, this philosophic toolkit, to the masses. And he was executed because he was corrupting, said to be corrupting the youth of Athens. This, even in Athens, a town that prided itself on speaking frankly, parhesia, uh, the, the, the Greek, uh, the Athenian virtue of speaking plainly and speaking the truth, even when it puts you at a disadvantage because Spe only in speaking the truth plainly will the society advance. He went too far. <laughs> and for this, he was executed. We shouldn't assume that these rocks that are stacked on top of one another are happy to be stacked on top of one another. It's the most common thing in history to see that whenever you have a new kind of understanding, what it immediately does is pisses on the kind of understanding beneath it. In fact, 
worse than that, it tries to scrub it out. So, oh, I don't have that picture in here, do I? Okay, so um, so uh, here is, I believe this is Plato, student of Socrates. Plato goes on to found his academy to bring this philosophic understanding to everyone. And his express goal is to do away with stories and, I don't think he's against metaphors, stories and songs and poetry, I guess probably metaphors through some of that things, through some of that stuff, because they're bad thinking. And bad thinking will lead to a terrible society, and a terrible society is what killed his teacher. And so he looks, and when he writes his book, The Republic, he says, we should ban the storytellers. We should ban so many of the artists who are not just, you know, making essentially propaganda. Now, he doesn't call it propaganda. He says, it's the truth, right? Okay, that's what every totalitarian government have forever has said. Um, but we, we need to ban, destroy these, these older tools. Um, and honestly, if you're looking at the... Uh, so Philosophic looks at romantic, sorry, looks at mythic where his culture was, and it says it is simple and it is evil. And then philosoph and then romantic looks on philosophic. Are you familiar with the um the idea of the two cultures of the modern academy? Big speech and essay that was made in the 1960s, talking about the fact that in the modern university, there are two different types of thinking. <laughs> And he, the author of it, C.P. Snow, said that one of them is like what we'd now call STEM, and the other one is what we'd now call humanities. And they have totally different understandings of what the goal of education is, and they have totally different understandings as to like what they even think of truth as being. Now, frankly, especially in the sixth year, whatever year since then, um, this idea that like it's humanities on one side and that it's STEM on the other side, here I'll just say humanities and STEM on the other side, it, it's not nearly so neat as that. You can find people who are in history who are very much like they would have otherwise been engineers. You can find people who are um, uh, maybe not the... You can find people in, a, in engineering who, you know, could have been, I don't know, poets or something like that. But this fight of values <laughs> um, uh, in what education is, is very much, Egan says, and I agree, a fight between the romantic understanding and philosophic understanding. And it doesn't just work like that, and, and it's, the, it's, it's, it's mutual too. Usually the STEM people ignore the human, humanities people because the STEM people have all the money, but right, whatever. Um, and what else? There is a, this is a famous, infamous quote by the physicist um, uh, Weinberg. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. This is the sort of thing that people in the romantic mindset say, what the heck are you people doing there in philosophic? This is not a way of living. This is no way of shaping a soul. This is the antithesis of education. And, and Weinberg, a physicist, said like, yeah, you know what? Like, you're kind of right. What we're doing is ultimately anti-human. Mm, he didn't say anti-human. Inhuman, I think, is a phrase that he used. Um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of bleakly nihilistic. Uh, this is a um, this is a big fight, uh, and the biggest, worstest part of it is something that Egan quotes. A complaint of Aboriginal people on the west coast of Canada who had been compelled to send their children to residential schools was that they taught them to read and made them stupid. The schools disrupted and significantly destroyed the children's native oral, spoken, listening, not writing, culture, using metaphors made up of stories, binaries, and in its place were able to put only a crude and debased literacy. And then, because he could get away with it, he wrote, this is analogous to what we do to most children in schools. Maybe both of these say that that's simple. And this looks at this and says it makes them stupid. Meanwhile, Somatic is over there playing by itself. You'd be happy to be ignored, be ignored by everybody. Okay. Here's the notion. 
it's not just that each of these ways of understanding was first birthed in some culture somewhere. It's that each of these ways of understanding was a revolution. Learning to speak was a revolution. The reason that we think that we learned to speak about yeah, 50 to 100,000 years ago is because it was about, well, there are different reasons for this, but um, uh, that's about 50 to 100,000 years ago that humans finally broke out of Africa and were able to overcome the um, uh, Neanderthals uh, on the north kind of border of Africa and the um, Homo erectus on the, never eat, the east border of Africa. Language seems to have been the revolution that allowed us to conquer the world. Learning to write was a revolution. We could take things outside of our heads and store them somewhere else. And there's a Socratic dialogue by Plato where he quotes one of the gods, Thoth, who uh, brings writing to the humans, uh, is, is explaining, like, oh, this will make humans smart. Um, uh, 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 and somebody else, one of the other gods, I think, responds, no, 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 that, it won't make them smart. It will make them stupid. But of course, it's also made us brilliant <laughs> being able to store it. If somebody figures something out somewhere, they write it down. And then it can sit in a book until somebody else picks it up, right? Like a week later, a hundred years later, and all of a sudden, like you can commune with that person. You can take their information and make it your own and use it in the world. Every one of these has been a revolution. The one thing that we know about revolutions is that you start by killing the people who held power before you. There's a dark history behind this. Um, actually, I wasn't even planning on it, but I think it's a good chance to take another whiff at this. Go ahead, take 20 seconds if you want to, if you have one burning inside of you. Egan's, Michelle guesses. Michelle, where would you guess Egan? Where do you want Egan's to be? I'll give a hint with this. Oh, through Egan's blank blanks. No, no, good guess. That would be very self-referential if Egan were on here. No, it's much bigger picture than that. Yeah, it's not, it's not Egan's, it's humanities. And make that fit come hell or high water. Any guesses for that word that starts with the letter F? I'll give you a hint. It's four letters long. I'm seeing four. I'm seeing four. The answer isn't four. <laughs> you walked into that one, didn't you? Thanks for playing along at home. <laughs> Okay, here's the deal. Each of these revolutions kind of sucks. And if you just stack these kinds of understanding together, I want to end that in some sort of ridiculous way. It's like, everyone would die. No, everyone would not die. But they would not work together harmoniously. Each on its own. Does this remind anybody of the... Um, of the sad triangle from our very first workshop, each on its own does things, <laughs> but then they want to cut down each other. Wouldn't it be great if there were some way of integrating these together? So what Egan proposes Probably the best way to do it is just to show it on here, is a fifth and final toolkit, a fifth and final kind of understanding. This comes from another specific moment in culture. I don't think he connects it as well as he really wants to, I'll be honest, uh, with a certain new kind of writing. You could say it, but I, I don't know what that, what the writing idea or the language idea, what that really adds to the conversation um, or helps us understand it better. Scholars worked for hundreds of years to make sense of the wild and woolly world around them. And eventually, <laughs> they realized that 
maybe it can't be done. <laughs> maybe you have, you know, a certain kind of like big theory, but that theory actually can't connect everything together. So I'm going to pull a punch here. I pull my punches here. Uh, because this is, you know, an actual sort of controversial take. But I'll just say that one of the things about the philosophic, about philosophic understanding is that it tends to turn everything into math, right? The old joke, I think I've said this before, maybe last week, uh, in college you learn that psychology is really biology, that biology is really chemistry, that chemistry is really physics, and that physics is really math, right? So like in the power of our understanding math is at the bottom of those well math itself is based is grounded is anchored in logic and for a while in the early part of the 1900s there was this obsessive quest to say okay like how can we how can we ground logic how can we prove that one plus one equals two and a book was written by russell uh, uh, alfred russell and uh, Alf or, sorry will come to me, by uh, Russell and Alfred. Wow, I'm not getting these names. Okay, Whitehead. Uh, these two people, very smart logicians, who came together and wrote a book called The Principia Mathematica that said, okay, can we prove that one plus one equals two? And they spent, I think it was 400 pages. They had invented a whole new symbolic notation system to express their ideas. And at the end of it, they proved that one plus one equal two. I'm not making this up. Except... <laughs> They then went on to find out that logic itself could not be grounded. That you had to start with some assumptions in making any kind of logical system of the one that they made. And it was, in fact, analytically proven in the, oh gosh, 19, late 1940s, I think, uh, the, by Kurt Godel, the Godel, I'm mispronouncing that, the, the Godel uh, incompleteness theorem. Um, shows that no, like you actually like it's it's groundless. At the end of the day, you can't have perfectly solid knowledge of anything, even of math or logic. And so, at the end, the scholars who really cared the most about certainty had to sort of shrug. Now, and they became ironic. <laughs> They had to learn that by saying something, they were not necessarily speaking the truth, that words did not map, could not map neatly onto reality. Now, when I hear scholar as being ironic, I think people like, I don't know, uh, Sartre, and I think Judith Butler, and I think Jean-Jacques Lyotard, and I think Zizek, and I think Camus, and I think a lot of people who actually smoked a lot of cigarettes and pipes. I actually hadn't put together the really heavy uh, tobacco. If kids are watching this, don't do drugs, kids. Um... But doesn't he look cool? No, doesn't look cool. He does not he look cool doing anything, to be fair. I think of these sorts of people when I think about, I don't know, ironists. When I think about people who are like, there is no truth, right? Truth is dead, that sort of thing. What's interesting is that Egan is not thinking about these people. Or rather, Egan is thinking about these people as having gone down an accidentally wrong route. A bad path. If you want to think about irony in postmodernism, think rather of postmodernist architecture, which is not obsessed with like, you know, God is dead, um, Gott ist tot, um, uh, or the death of truth or the death of beauty, but rather the death of having to get it right. The death of having to have one system that makes sense of everything. So this is a piece of postmodern architecture. This is actually where James Bond hangs out. It's MI6 headquarters in, uh, in, in, in England. And does that look like modern architecture, but also kind of like a castle to anybody else? Here's a Frank Gehry piece. I don't like Frank Gehry. I'll be honest with you. This doesn't do anything for me. But right, you can see that this is somebody who is freed of conventions and also gets paid a lot of money. I like this better, right? Like you don't need to just do the same thing that people have always done and just kind of like work in that tradition. You can mix and match traditions. You can go and do wild new things. You are freed to do that. You know, or to make a Christmas tree of a apartment complex. It's a 
Egyptian pyramid? I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, right? You can just be really playful if you want to be really playful. This is the sort of irony that Egan says is now open to us when we realize that, you know what, like, there's not just one right way that we have, that we're in, imprisoned to, that we're enchained to. If anything, if before we were talking about, first we were talking about these stages as one thing that you jump to and you leave behind and said, no, 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 a better way of doing it is to understand these as stacking or kind of nesting inside of one another. We said, well, that doesn't actually work because they don't, they don't merge together, right? They actually kind of like are at war with one another. They want to kill each other, sort of. I should have had a picture in here of like them like being like, I don't know, shooting each other. I, that would have taken a lot of work. Instead, what Egan suggests at the end that we can do is we can take these rocks and we can juggle them. We can take these boulders, these platforms, and we can, we can play with them. When it suits us, when we get to this... I'll say level. I feel like level is an important aspect of this. When we build all of these kinds of understanding and recognize in the end that all of them are insufficient, we can say, well, which of these suits me right now? So you can take, you know, like if you're doing policy proposals for a government, you can take a libertarian argument when you think that that would do the most good. Or you can take a socialist argument or, or uh, policy prescription when you think that that would actually cause the most beauty in the world, or you can take a whatever. You are free to choose to mix and match, to become your own person and to make your society the way that you want it to be made. The things that this then allows is for these things to build together. Sorry, to knit themselves together. So, but philosophic, oh, crucially, which is blue, what philosophic can give to ironic is power. Because, as we remember from last week, philosophic understanding does not lack for power when you do it right. Irony by itself is feckless. It is pointless. It is unable to do anything, right? So you get this stereotype of like, I don't know, like the slacker, the sort of like 20 year old slackers, like there is no truth and so nothing matters and so blah, right? And they can't do anything. Well, if they were all, if they were also a genetic biologist, right? Like a, a geneticist, like then they'd be able to do something <laughs> with their irony. Um, what ironic understanding gives to philosophic understanding is it can say, hey, chill out. Stop obsessing with getting it all right. You will never be able to get it all right. You can relax. Under the auspices of ironic, which covers everything then. I don't like that. I want that to be solid. It would look better. And I can do that because I am free. To do, I'm, I'm in the thrall of no one system. What under the auspices of irony romantic can give to philosophic is life and energy. This is the standard cut against the philosophic mindset that the humanists always make, that you people, this is dry, this is desiccated, this is boring, this is pointless, this is just, maybe not pointless, but this is, uh, this is terrible, this is, in, this is unhuman. But if you contain, Egan says, all of these romantic associations, you can keep up, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can power uh, philosophic understanding from that and not lose the good things. What philosophic gives to romantic is direction. Because, okay, right, like you can, let's say that you can make, you can find the heroic attributes in anything. 
well, wouldn't it be nice that instead of like picking random rocks that are outside your house, that'd be kind of cool to be, to be clear, right? Like you can focus on the things that will give you the best big picture understanding of the world. This is actually an important point in how Egan has been suggesting all along we think about these, uh, uh, how we build the curriculum. When we're in elementary school, we're always looking ahead to what we want to be doing in middle and high school. When we're in middle school, we're always looking ahead to what we'll want to be doing in high school. This is part of why history is so very important to Egan in the early stages, even though it kind of, it becomes a bit less important. Uh, it sort of bows to social science uh, and science, science, uh, the natural sciences uh, in, uh, in, in the end of the high school curriculum. Um, the ironic can give to romantic an expanding of the moral universe. You know this phrase by Peter Singer, the expanding circle of empathy? Where, you know, like the natural thing seems to be for humans to, as well as virtually every other animal, I think every other animal under most circumstances, uh, to only care about helping the other animals that are the most closely related to you. Um, and then with humans, right, we kind of build that into tribes and build that into sorry, clans and then tribes and then kingdoms, right? But we're still very ethnocentric. We're still very nationalistic or whatever, right? Political sort of centric, right? right? Death to the Republicans, death to the liberals, um, whatever. But ironic says, you know, it's kind of interesting, you people who are in romantic understanding, that you're so big on supporting your own local heroes. Maybe what you can do is support the heroes of the other side, right? Like you, you go to a go to a, a football game and everyone's like rooting for their own team, and the ironist comes in and says, you know what? Like those people on the other team, they can kind of do some impressive things too, <laughs> which might be really hard to see if you're just in a romantic understanding. Um, the people in your city who might be the greatest are the people who are the down and out, who are the oppressed. This is what ironic understanding can give to romantic. Um, what ironic, sorry, what ironic can give to mythic, a lot of, a lot of mythic ends up being sort of brought into romantic and into philosophic, right? The metaphors never stop. The simple stories of mythic become the complex stories, become the complex, complex narratives in romantic, become the meta narratives in philosophic. What ironic can give to mythic and then thus to all of these is the idea that, okay, these stories are fine to tell. You shouldn't stop telling these stories. Stories are important or whatever. But you need to remember that a story, the story that you're telling is a thing that you are telling. The map is not the territory. The story is not the same thing as reality. See that they are stories. And I have that kind of ironic distance from what we are talking about. But then you know to be able to switch into mythic understanding when it helps. And what semantic gives to all of this Maybe, I mean, semantic is everything to all of us, right? It keeps building through. But then what semantic gives to ironic is that ironic can always say like, ah, oh, geez, like, is anything true? Well, Egan suggests that people who obsess with that question are not people who have gone for a good ski recently. They're not people who have gone for a good dip in a hot tub recently. There is this reality that we encounter before we know language that is just around us. And the feelings that we get from this are the most vivid feelings and experiences that we possibly have. Egan is really big in knitting in the sort of like dreamlike intensity of physical and emotional and perceptual experience to all of education. I'm gonna say a sense of reality. That's probably a better way of saying that that I'm missing. Ironists historically get caught up in thinking everything is just language games. Nope, nope, not true, not true. We are embodied, we are somatic. Okay, so from that. Anyone want to take a guess for any of these? Actually, I think we might have them. Oh, 
Oh, wow, that's good. Oh, wow. Okay, so I wasn't going to put Juggly in here. My original thing was keeping alive the old ones. But I think I'm going to replace that with juggling. Whichever of those sounds better for you is great. Well, keeping juggling the old ones. Yeah, in five. People frequently came to Egan and said, I think I've found a sixth kind of understanding. And always, he reports, nope, it would just be romantic. It was always just romantic. I, this new kind of spirituality that, nope, nope, it's always, it's always, it's always just romantic or some mix of some of the other ones. What's interesting to me is that there was a period in human history where there was only one, and then there's a period where there's only two, and then three, and then four, and then five. It is not impossible that there is still a different kind of understanding, or more than one, to be given in the future. Just thinking about what that could look like is something that I spend a bunch of time doing. The word that I have here is copy. I wanted to have something that would show that we are borrowing these from other people, that we are connecting to other people. I don't think the word copy really does that. Um, mimic? Nah, I spent such a long time trying to come up with a better word for that. So I'm not, at the end of the day, right, like, at the end of the day, Egan said my entire system, right, kind of seems to me like a locomotive that is going too fast or too slow or parts of it are not really connected to each other, right? In the end, he actually had this ironic distance from this whole uh, this whole cognitive toolkit idea that he had come up with, this whole cultural recapitulation cognitive toolkit that he had come up with. And I do too. <laughs> I, I both am a true believer <laughs> in this. Um, I think this is the best chance that we have to help mend the world. And yet, when I look at it, I'm like, really? Is this really exactly <laughs> what's going on? It seems to have its insufficiencies, its deficiencies. It's, um, And I will say that even more so about my summary of this. Practice is not a bad word. Practice, especially as I imagine, like, practicing something. I like practice. I like practice. Opinion. Whether you say juggling or alive, it makes this into a what two different parts of speech. So there's a, a zuguma, I think. Um, zuguma is a word for that. Um, yeah. Okay. So great. Congratulations. We've done it. Huzzah. I want to take all of this and connect it together by imagining Egan and hot takes. The sense that I get from what Egan was trying to do and the way that he was trying to do it. He was trying to broadcast his system and get everybody who was interested in alternate methods of education, inter you know, interested in this. Um, and so he recognized, this is my hypothesis on this, that it would be the stupidest thing in the world to tick other people off. I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> the way that I come at thinking about ideas is with wanting to argue and to point out the insufficiencies in all other ideas. And then I always want other people to do that to me. I actually run a political fight club where we, where we, where we do this, and it is one of the great joys of my life. I want to imagine Egan's hot takes on other ways of doing education. I want you to imagine this with me. Okay, so, so far as I know, Egan never said anything negative about Waldorf. Maybe he did. In fact, if anyone knows about this, please send me an email about this. I, I, want, I want to start understanding this because I'm sure that I'm not going to get this entirely right. But right now, what do you think, if you, if you know anything about Waldorf education, what do you think Egan would say is good about Waldorf education? What do you think he would say is bad about it? Actually, hold on. Before we do in Waldorf, Oh, did I? Nope, sorry. I meant to do Montessori first. Let me do Montessori first for the reason. 
my hunch on this is that Egan used to work in a Montessori, in more than influenced, but not a doctrinaire Montessori school. So if you think about the toolkits of, oh, he's black, of somatic, mythic, romantic, philosophic. I'm not even going to put in ironic for this, because ironic comes so much later into so few people. Okay. That what Egan would suggest is that in Montessori education, they go from the somatic, the hands-on, the sensory, and they try to jump right to the philosophic. You know, the ideas, the concepts. My wife used to be, as a Montessori-trained teacher, used to work at, at a very doctrinaire Montessori school. Really good one, too. Because um, remember, schools are more than their philosophies. They're also how well they're run. Um, and and has, knows quite a bit about the life of Maria Montessori and said, yep, that's Montessori to a T. She misses the middle. Now, this is not often practiced in Montessori education. But Maria Montessori does not want teachers to tell their students stories that aren't true. And I've worked with a really wonderful classical Montessori teacher, and she, no, she would never tell the students something that was not true. I do not know how she lived sharing a classroom for a year with me when I would just lie to the students bald-facedly. <laughs> Which, you know, I think it's really important that you, that students learn, you know, to sharpen their crap detection systems. Um, there's not that much in the way of storytelling in Montessori education, even about things that are true. And honestly, I will say that when you look at a lot of them, it might cut on the Montessori works that they do. You know, there are a lot of uh, patterns, right? Patterns is a... Uh, is a um, Oh, yeah, patterns is a somatic thing. Um, there's a lot of sensory, okay, I guess but maybe just those two things. Um, there's a lot of that. It's very mathematical, logical mathematical. But on the ones that are scientific, they're really shallow. They're just like, match these terms. Put these animals in the map where they live. I've never, have, rarely had such a sad experience with education as when I went to... Um, the sort of graduation ceremony, the, the, the project display of uh, when my wife um, became a Montessori teacher. And uh, uh, everyone had to make their own sort of little project to do in the class. And they were all pathetic. They were all, almost all, almost all. Uh, not my wife's and not uh, one and maybe two other people's. Um, but the rest of them were just like, let's match things. Let's feel things. I think he would be disgusted <laughs> by that because they're missing the flipping middle. Okay, so take that, Montessori. I feel mean now. That's fine. I like being mean sometimes. Okay, now, how do you think he would talk about Waldorf education? Yeah, total lack of imagination. Yeah, they don't... Well, I can't say they don't appreciate jokes. I need to be careful that I'm not speaking beyond my... Ability. And, and, and look, an important thing to realize about monastery education is that there was a law, lawsuit in America in the 1980s, I think, maybe 70s, where um, the, one of the monastery training centers wanted to say, like, hey, like, these schools are saying that they're Montessori, but they're not actually doing Dr. Montessori stuff. Hey, guys, that's not legal. And the judge ruled, like, nope, like, you've gone too long. You've let schools use the word Montessori for, to, to mean whatever they want it to mean. And so you can't actually... Um, force people to stick to this. So a lot of Montessori schools, what they do is, you know, takes a lot of stuff from Montessori, but then adds a bunch of other stuff in. Didn't appreciate your child's humor. Yeah, my neither of my two kids either. <laughs> we sent both of our kids to Montessori schools when we could afford it, which is to say when we could get teacher discounts <laughs> for it. And now to be fair, no schooling uh, system that we were able to find ever worked for our kids, but boy, did they crash and burn in them. So I think that Egan would love um, the uh, the amount of stories that they tell and the amount of um, I don't know the stories. He just loved the stories, the the, ima the imagination. The focus is on art and beauty and the imagination, and that's very much mythic and romantic stuff. What I think he would have a hard time with is one the fact that okay, so this I need to be careful not to speak beyond my ability level. I don't know Waldorf as well as I know most of these other ones. And frankly, I would love to meet a Waldorfian. I used to have a friend who is a past Waldorfian. Um, 
and, and talk about Egan with them to see if I'm getting this right. But from the things that I understand and I've read about Waldorf education, um, their science curriculum was kind of bad. <laughs> It's it's not that sciencey. They're more excited about like here's the spiritual value of this thing that we were saying about the butterfly or whatever, and they don't really get into what the butterfly is. They're not nearly as philosophical as an Aganian in a uh, education um, uh, would be. Um, I guess they're somatic. Honestly, I, I suppose I should probably include the somatic in there. They're a lot about movement, right? Their whole um, uh, eurythmicity. I'm mispronouncing that. Um, so they're they're really big in that. They don't do that. They also uh, they don't do philosophic. Also, back to the, they don't use black crayons. At least one training center that another friend of mine who studied under this uh, 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 went to. They're afraid of darkness. They don't think that kids are ready for darkness. And from the little that I've seen, lived out Waldorf education, it tends to be very sentimental. Montessori can be very sentimental too. Egan has a whole section in one of his books uh, at the end of the chapter, a mythic, I think, from kinds of from um, uh, uh, the, the educated mind, where he he just lambasts a saccharine, sugary, sentimental education, saying that it insults kids' emotional development. I suspect, though I don't know, that Egan would say that Waldorf, in some ways, insults kids' emotional development. Okay. I want to point out that in some ways, Montessori and Waldorf are almost inverses of each other. I uh, I was talking to my wife about this today, saying like, oh, like, so somebody maybe could just like do a good job if they wanted to get like an Eganian education of uh, of like getting a bunch of Montessori works and a bunch of Waldorf stuff. She's like, yeah, I try to do it. The thing is, the whole systems like they want to pull you in different directions. They <laughs> you not play. They don't they don't want to play well together. Um, but then she said, like, maybe I could have done that better job of that, or maybe now that I'm homeschooling, I could do that better or whatever. So, so I, there's potential maybe for an overlap, for a combination here. If you want to do Egan on the quick and cheap, actually, that's stupid because the works from Montessori and all the stuff from Waldorf, the most expensive single items you will ever purchase. Um, something else though, and that is that there's a specific word that I've never mentioned. I've actually, I think, taken care to not mention in any of these workshops until a moment ago. And it is the most important word to Egan. <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess as to what it is? I'll give you a hint. It starts with the letter I. So after he wrote, no, it's not ideology, it's imagination. So Egan, after he wrote his book, uh, Educated Mind, you know, he said, okay, like I have all these books. I have a model put out. I'm, I'm making up these words. I don't know that this is exactly the way that the story went, and I'd actually really like to understand that. But um, I, need, I need a way of, of, of advertising this. I need, I need a word that can capture all of this. And for him, the word that, that brought all of these together, all of these toolkits, all of these kinds of understanding together, was the one word, imagination. I've not mentioned that in, at all. In fact, his, his group, or uh, his, his way of teaching is called Imaginative Education, or IE for short. I've got to tell you the truth. This has never worked for me. In fact, at one of the conferences they did uh, back in 2012 or 13 or something, I went and I gave a speech, and the speech was arguing, we should stop using the word imagination. I think it's confusing people. I think people hear the word imagination and it immediately connotes this idea of, I don't know, like Waldorf, of like, oh, like they're hearing stories and they're doing, getting to do creativity. He, Egan actually hated the word creativity. Um, creativity to him was all about like, what are you creating physically in the world? What are you doing, right? It has to be productive. It has to be, um, and for Egan, right, like what you want to be, more of what you want to cultivate uh, in kids is the sort of dreamlike reverie of, uh, you know, it just kind of sits back and like, 
falls in love with reality. And then, you know, trusting that action will come from that. But you don't want to push to, you know, start to have to create things. And, you know, the way that creativity is often operationalized in psychological research is like, okay, like here is a brick. How many ways, what, how many things could you do with a brick? And, right, you have two minutes. Go, write them down. And, like, whoever can come with the most ideas or the most diverse ideas, like, is the winner. And Egan's like, that's not, that's not, a, that's not, that's creativity. Fine. If that's creativity, I don't want any part of it. What's interesting is that I think that an Egan education would produce much more creative kids than any other kind of education. Because you're taking all of these things from the, you know, wild, wildest, biggest parts of the world and planting them as seeds inside of your head until you have this jungle inside of your head. As Nietzsche wrote, one must have chaos inside oneself to give birth to a dancing star. I think that's what an Egan education gives you. But he never used the word creativity. He used the word imagination, but I think that that also failed um, because it, it connotes, I don't know, unserious education. If it works for you, great. But know that when you see imaginative education online, that's Egan's stuff. Um, and ironic. And ironic. All of those together to be able to balance them out. His imagination. Okay. What do you think Egan, his hot take would be on unschooling? Go for it. I spent a long time looking for a picture in unschooling before I realized, oh no, the entire idea of unschooling means that you could never find a photograph. <laughs> That would, that would actually like to know this is unschooling, right? What you want to do is find kids doing other things. And so I, I came to this one finally. Allison, you're bringing up Sir Ken Robinson. I have to tell you, I hate Sir Ken Robinson. He's a fantastic... Egan has never said anything negative about Sir Ken Robinson. Why would he? It'd be, it'd be foolish. If you guys don't know Sir Ken Robinson, uh, 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 what was he, he? He broke through by making. He worked in education for a very long time, um, arts education, and then gave this really fantastic TED talk right at the time. I think in the late aughts when uh, TED talks were really taking off, and so his one might be the the best viewed of all time, or you're probably close to it. I think it's in the top ten. Last time I looked, yeah, no, right. It's, it's, if you like, if you like it, it's fantastic. Here's what I don't like about Ken Robinson. When I read his stuff or when I watch his TED Talk and try to take notes, there's nothing there. <laughs> it's just set kids free, which, okay, great. And so now we can take now we can take this idea of like setting kids free. But the rest of everything that he does, it's just a just show. <laughs> it's there's 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 no substance there. Now, except for the one idea of set kids free, which is exactly what unschooling does. Um, I will say that I am not anti-unschooling. Uh, some of the very smartest kids that I've ever met were fairly radically unschooled. Um, and I, um, uh, and my wife and I practice something that is kind of unschooling-ish. Although maybe that means that it's not unschooling at all. If it's only unschooling-ish. I can, I can take that. Um, what I think that Egan would love about unschooling is that unschooling is focused on passion, it's focused on interest. And Egan is all about that. What I think he would not like about unschooling is, one, that the function of school, the function of education, is specifically to broaden one's interests. Egan thought that everything is interesting. And that, without having to try so very hard, <laughs> we can get kids interested in almost everything. And that it's only by having people who have these, you know, ecumenical, these universal interests that we're going to be able to have the kinds of adults who are going to be able to go on and change the world. In unschooling, Developing interests is a thing that comes from the kid, and the whole point of unschooling is to not force other things on, the idea that that would hurt the kid's interests. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, especially the way that school is usually done. I think that compared to most other types of schooling, 
for many and possibly most kids, unschooling is ridiculously much better. <laughs> um, but Egan would say that it is likely to fail in producing so many broad interests. If that's not true for your kid, then that's not true for your kid, and that's great. <laughs> um, I'm hypothesizing what Egan would say here, not telling anyone what to do. Egan would intriguingly, I think, also say that in some sense, unschooling at least can be, and I've seen it done this way, is can be radically self-oriented. Whereas for Egan, the whole point of education, in fact, not the whole point of education, the definition of education is connection. Not just with the people around you or like the world, you know, that you see through your computer or you see like in your suburbs or whatever, but with the weirdest and then the most boring things in all the disciplines and all of the parts of the world. And then connecting in a much more profound way with the people who have come before you and developed these understandings. It's not just like the socio-cultural sort of learning where like you're learning from your culture, this, this, this meta socio, this meta-cultural way where like you're going back thousands of years and you're being able to do something because cavemen did it before you and because, you know, romantic poets or whatever did it before you or whatever. Um, how about classical? In his heart, I think Egan was most similar to the classical education. And um, to put my cards on the table, so am I. I fell in love with homeschooling when I was in high school, and I ran across a catalog of a classical homeschooling curriculum. And um, just uh, just like oozed over. I thought, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe that I could actually have been learning these things all along. And so I dropped out of high school for a year uh, to homeschool myself using a classical curriculum. Turns out I was super lazy and I did not appreciate that about myself. And so I, um, I it didn't, didn't work. Didn't, it didn't work for me. I went back to, to high school my senior year. Um, there was a debate that happened between the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and um, the children's book author, Philip Pullman. Um, back when religion was like the hot button issue that people, you know, back in the elite aughts that everybody loved to argue about online. But they had an in-person debate or conversation or something. And, you know, Philip Pullman, if you have read the book series, His Dark Materials, is uh, very anti-religious. <laughs> um, and the Archbishop of Canterbury is very religious. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, first of all, they're two wonderful intellectuals, and it was wonderful to get to see kind of how they exchanged and how they, you know, cared for one another in that conversation. But at the end, the last question they get from the audience is something like, what do you guys think that we should do with education? And Pullman just spat out this line of what I want to do is introduce children to the riches, the philosophical, the artistic, the scientific, the literary riches of the whole world. They are the heirs and inheritors of those riches. And William said, yes, that. <laughs> Both of those people were, had been shaped themselves by this classical curriculum, where kids become the heirs and inheritors of the riches of the world. Egan uh, loved that. Egan loved that full stop. <laughs> but what Egan would say again and again in his books, he says that if you don't do this using these cognitive tools, these cultural cognitive tools, if you don't do this using metaphors and stories and, and abstract binary opposites and, um, and building on emotions and connecting to ideals, all of that, all these things, this could just be dead information. And that throughout history has been the way that classical schooling has been done for, for you know, a millennia all, and more. All there was was classical education, and it was terrible, unless one happened to be of a certain kind of person that just absolutely loved that sort of thing, right? I, I think I am. <laughs> um, the modern classical movement got started off by an essay of Dorothy Sayers, uh, the Father Brown, novelist, mystery writer, um, essayist, uh, called The Lost Tools of Learning. Where she talks about the medieval curriculum, which was based in, in order grammar and then logic and then rhetoric, and said, this is how we should make all of our education today. 
And that idea has really has really gone and flown. I fell in love with classical education uh, on the writing of a woman named Susan Wise Bauer, who I've mentioned a few times. She's the person who said that, uh, that in some ways, history is not a subject. History is the subject, something that Egan would very much agree with, right? Because everything that we learn started in somebody's head sometime. Um, Bauer also builds in the system of grammar, logic, rhetoric. It's taken me years to realize that I think that those three stages are mostly crap. And that the things that are great about classical education have something to do with those. She and Dorothy Sayers had interpreted grammar to mean you can just pump a bunch of stuff in kids' heads as opposed to like having to wait for a really long time. That's kind of good. <laughs> Pumping things in heads is a weird metaphor to use, right? It's not the same thing as using cognitive tools to get kids to fall in love with things, right? But insofar as I see actual like grammar and logic and rhetoric actually applied in classical education, I'm always like, why are you doing this? I have taken a substack. I have started a substack. I started it almost a year ago on my 40th birthday, I think. <laughs> and I called it the Lost Tools of Learning in homage to Dorothy Sayers. But I think the real lost tools of learning are Egan's, are the tools that Egan points out. Um, so, dead information as opposed to living knowledge. If you know the, um, the Charlotte Mason approach to homeschooling, it kind of does classical and kind of makes it a bit Waldorfian and kind of a bit outdoorsy, and they talk about the importance of having living books, and I love that metaphor. Charlotte Mason, maybe more than any other approach, though I know I haven't mentioned it at all, does kind of an Egan education. I should know more about Charlotte Mason before I say that for sure. The final one might be vocational education, which we haven't talked at all about. But, you know, it's a real thing. I think Egan would say to this that it's great to have kids working in the real world. There's a sense of purpose and of meaning that comes from I'm learning the skill and the skill is useful and I can use the skill. Um, it's somatic. It's totally somatic, right? Um, and I suppose insofar as you could kill yourself doing any of these things, there's sort of the mythic binary of alive versus dying painfully. So great that. Um, but what Egan would say, I think, is that, I feel pretty confident in this one actually, because uh, is, is, is he would say that vocational ed is so ready to be Eganized. I'm sure he would not have used that word to take all the skills that people learn and the concepts that they need to learn to, you know, do things like plumbing or AC or electric electrical work or whatever, um, and show the wonder that is actually inside of them. Because when you're working with things in the real world, oh my gosh, it's so great. The book Shop Class is Soulcraft, I think, really gets at this sort of idea. Um, he has a, he was going to write a book called, I think, Split the School. He never got around to writing it. I don't know if his notes exist. But his notion was, if you wanted to just do the cheapest, easiest, easiest thing to improve schools, in middle school, split them into two, have an academic route, and have a vocational route. And then use the cognitive tools, use the kinds of understanding to revolutionize and make both as intellectually vibrant as you possibly can. And then we will have a better society. I think that's Egan's How Do You Mend the World. Um, there is this, by the way, which, um, uh, Annabella, if you are looking at this right now, you're so cool! Thank you for making this new, higher quality version of this. I've been using the old one forever. Uh, but you're so cool even without that. Uh, uh, this, this is one way of breaking down the tools that Egan wrote. Feel free to take a screenshot. Actually, if you want to take a screenshot of that right now, I will remove myself. There's never been an official list of Egan's 
tools, and there are different ways of summarizing them. I've tried to give you one. This is another attempt to do that. And then finally, before we go, the sad triangle. I guess I didn't have a picture of this, but the sad triangle that we were talking about in the beginning, socialize, academicize, and develop. How does Egan actually come together with this? Where does his method, his paradigm sit on this? Here's the notion. As you recapitulate, as you recap, as you do again in your own self what has been done in the wider world, you are being socialized. You're not being socialized by your local culture. You're being socialized in popular local culture, of course, but insofar as schools are doing this, you're being socialized by, you know, cavemen, <laughs> by romantic poets, by Socrates. Socrates is Egan's ironist extraordinaire. So buoyant, so happy, so unsettled. Um, uh, you're being shaped by these people. How is it academic? Well, it's academic in that you are learning so flipping much. In order to become educated in Egan's understanding of the word education, you need to learn more than anyone currently learns in school. And not only do you need to learn it, like the facts of it, you need to feel the joy and the zeal of it. And you need to care a lot about truth. Even if in the end you provisionally give up on being able to figure out a lot of types of truth, maybe ultimate truths, or not. I think I'm not saying that very well. And how is it developmental? Well, this is how an individual develops. This is how individuals have developed since forever. <laughs> at least educated individuals, or at least for the last 2,000 years when we first built the ironic toolkit, starting with Socrates. But before that, right, like you go through these stages. These stages have to build, to some extent, have to build on top of one another. And you're doing this in your own way. You're becoming your own person. No two people schooled through, through this will ever become the same, right? They're not trying to socialize and to squeeze them together like we talked about with this. You really are doing all of these things as you lift up. I guess I did three arrows up, right? As you brought these three arrows up to lift people up to this really high level of understanding. That's all I got. Thanks for coming to this. I'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards in case anybody has any questions. Sorry, this is, they've all gone. Sorry, this is, they've all gone so late. It's been a pleasure. The next steps I will say that I'm looking to take in this is um, I'm interested in seeing if I can raise some money to take a week and just turn everything of this into a bunch of punchy, fast paced um, uh, YouTube videos. I don't know how long this will take. I don't know when I'll be able to get that sort of funding or whatever to do that, but I, I'd love if the entire world knew all of this stuff. So that's a project that's going to come from this. If you're interested in helping support me in that, please let me know. Um, uh, two is, I think that what I want a lot of the rest of my life to be once I finish up the next six years of our Science is Weird cycle is to um, help make schools that are organized. Uh, so look forward to me doing a bunch on that. And in the next few years, uh, to make some small pieces of these curriculums, uh, each of these stages, each of these kinds of understanding, each of these age brackets that people can download and can, you know, they won't be exhaustive. They won't tell you day one, day two, day three, here's everything that you do. But they will give you like some tastes <laughs> and some ability to start doing an eganized uh, education on your own for this. Useful for homeschoolers, useful for schools as well. Anything else? The next few weeks, what I'm going to be doing is taking everything from all of these workshops and writing them up. Feel free to write any questions right now in uh, uh, this. Uh, taking everything that I've we've presented <laughs> and turning it into a book review of Egan's The Educated Mind. Because it turns out that the original reason I had... <laughs> doing these workshops in the first place, my secret reason for doing it was just to force me to reread all of Educated Mind. <laughs>
and get really conversant on understanding it so that I could do a great review of it. And when I say great, I mean positive because obviously I love it, but also a hard hitting when I can make it hard hitting, right? Review of it for a book review contest um, that uh, that goes on once a year from one of my favorite blogs. Uh, so look for that. It will recap a bunch of the stuff that we've talked about, miss some of the other parts of it, and then go into uh, the theory more. The theory will probably be a lot more of it than it has been of, of this. We'll be connecting to some other stuff and asking some questions about uh, things that uh, Egan, um, uh, asking some questions that Egan didn't ask and seeing how Egan's ideas can shine some lights on um, some other kind of problems uh, that we have with the world and um, some questions that we have about the world. Would he be against formal academic writing like that found in Michael Clay Thompson during the middle school years? I don't know that, Anna. I apologize. Feel free to say who that is. Will I send the link when I write the review? Yeah, I will probably I will probably do that. So, yeah, sorry. I'll definitely do that to everybody who's in part of this. I might do it with our larger uh, community of Science Squared subscribers. Humanized math and science sound great. Would Egan think kids need to learn advanced math or how to solve scientific equations if they are not planning to use it in their future? Great question, Michelle. So Egan planned to write his book on philosophic understanding and never did it. So I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think there is not like a, you know, a orthodox Egan answer to this. I will say <laughs> that what I would love to see happen, and there's lots of people who say this. This is, this is not a hot take of mine. This is like me being pretty boring. What a lot of people would like to see happen with the high school math curriculum um, is for it to split into two halves. One half can continue to be the really academic thing that we do. Um, that you know, the capstone of that is always going to well, in, uh, is always. Um, sorry, what's the word? Calculus. Um, a lot of people will say, well, maybe the capstone of that should be statistics instead. Yeah, maybe, maybe both of those. Um, statistics is more useful than calculus is for. 90 something percent of people um uh so i think there still should be a path for really academic sort of like truth for the sake of truth sort of math now it needn't be just calculus though right you can just go into number theory you can go into all sorts of things and understand just like the depths of math with that you can actually go into logic i mean we talk about you know I mean, every kid learn computer programming. Maybe everyone was saying that more five and ten years ago than they are now. Um, but you know, that's kind of a math sort of thing. Uh, so you could talk about like going really academic with that. There's also so much practical math that can be learned. Um, uh, I one of the most intellectually exciting periods of my life was when I was tutoring a college student who um, hated math and was no good at math. And um, so he took his college's like lowest level, you know, as would get him to graduate math class. And the book, I'm forgetting the name of the book, it's something like Everyday Math, but I'm sure half of the math textbooks are called Everyday Math. Um, uh, the textbook was all about the mathematics of, oh, just for example, like um, compound interest. And actually had them like do the formulas and over compound interest. And oh my gosh, was that interesting and so useful. And I really wish I had known that. Um, and the math of voting. And you actually had to prove, I think you had to prove Arrow's theorem that, you know, like some people are like, oh, we should have whoever gets the most votes. Like that, that's, that's how you should do voting things. And people are like, no, you should do instant runoff voting. And other people are like, oh, you should have like this like complex system where like you can apportion your votes, but you can like, give all of your votes, you have like 10 votes, you can all the one person or like split it off and like give it to like, give like one person each or like, you know, give half to this guy and like dawdle out the rest like to everybody else, dribble them out to everybody else. There's, you can look at the math of this and you can actually find just using math, like, oh, if there are actually situations where every single one of those will break down and give you exactly the situation that you don't want, where you elect the person that like everyone, everyone agrees, oh my gosh, like, that person got the least votes. Well, every system can actually backfire. <laughs> um, such amazing stuff. So I, uh, I would love, I would love to see um, two branches for that. I guess that wasn't your question. Um, Fireworks Press. Oh, this is the um, the Michael Clay Thompson during the middle school years. My gosh, uh, I, it's the curriculum that's commonly recommended for kids gifted in language arts. Dang it! I feel bad that I don't know about that. I'll have to look that up, Anna. Thank you very much for that. Um. Okay, 
Can we go have some dinner? Thank you all very much. This has been one of the most exciting intellectual experiences of my life.